If you've been building PCs for a while, you might have been wondering why do CPUs need such massive coolers or even water coolers to keep themselves barely under 100 degrees, while GPUs that use a lot more power need much smaller coolers compared to the large heat sinks you see for CPUs. Well, in this video, I'm trying to explain that. Anyways, you can see here the die shot or die drawing of an RTX 4090 versus a Core i9-12900K. The 4090 has a TDP rating of 450 watts, which not all of it goes to the core, but let's just say all of it goes to the core, and the 12900K has 300 watts of heat dissipation. Now the 12900K has 208mm square for the die size itself, and the 4090 has 608mm square of die size. If you calculate the wattage divided by the die size, you can see that the 4090 is less than half the heat density of the 12900K. And that is already, logically, you can understand why the 12900K runs much hotter, because it has twice the heat density of the RTX 4090. And if you look at the die shots, it's actually even worse, because for CPUs, the majority of the heat generating components are the CPU cores. And if you see that the sides of the die itself are consumed by components that don't consume much power. So the majority of the heat is really concentrated on the middle, just on the CPU cores. And if you compare it to the die shot of an RTX 4090, which is a GPU, you can see that the GPU cores take up a majority of the space of the die itself, which means that the heat is even more better spread out throughout the die than a CPU is, while the CPU also already have a smaller die area in the first place, which just makes the increased heat density of CPUs an even bigger problem for cooling them. But how does that relate to needing a larger cooler for CPUs? Well, to understand that, I think we need to look at the equations for thermal conductivity as well as uh, heat transfer. So for thermal conductivity, you might have seen watts per millimeter Kelvin on thermal paste or something like that, which has a specification sheet. And in this case, we'll use the thermal conductivity of silicon for this explanation, which is 0.148 watts per millimeter Kelvin. And thermal conductivity is essentially just how much heat can you move through a material with a difference of one Kelvin between two sides and a length of one millimeter. That is thermal conductivity. Now we can use thermal conductivity in the equation for heat transfer, which is over here. As you can see, K, the, in this case, K is thermal conductivity, not Kelvin. And heat transfer is essentially just saying how many watts you can transfer given a certain thermal conductivity at a certain area, at a certain delta temperature, at a certain thickness or length that the heat has to travel through. For the explanation here, I'll just use 0.46 millimeter for the CPU and GPU die thickness because under Bauer's video, when he deleted these CPUs, he showed that the 12900K has a die thickness of 0.46 millimeter and we'll just assume the 4090 also has a die thickness of 0.46 millimeter. And plugging in the values to the equation for heat transfer over here, at 450 watts for the 4090 and 300 watts for the 1200K, the 4090 needs a delta temperature of 2.3 kelvins between the bottom of the die and the top of the die in order to dissipate its 450 watts, while the smaller 1200K with its smaller 300 watts of heat needs 4.48 kelvins of delta temperature between the bottom of the die and the top of the die. And just from this calculation alone, you can see that the smaller die size of the CPU, like a 12900K or even any of the newer CPUs, require a higher difference between the temperature of the heat generating component and the part that's cooling it. In this case, we'll just, we're just talking about inside the silicon cell, so the heat needs to go from the heat generation components up to the top of the die. And because of that, you can also understand that with CPUs, you need a larger delta temperature between the CPU die itself and the base of the cooler that's cooling the die compared to a GPU. So as I was editing the video, I realized that I could have explained this part better because this is literally the point of the video. So I'm just redoing it again here. Um, essentially what I was trying to say is that when you're cooling a CPU or a GPU, uh, you have a system of components that the heat has to travel to. 
and the heat amount that has to travel through the components all the way until it reaches the air is going to be the same as the amount of heat that the component is producing. So let's say for a CPU, the heat, if it generates 300 watts of heat, 300 watts has to go from the die and to the IHS and then to the cooler base and to the heatsink fins and then into the air finally. Now again, we've explained before that even in the die itself, it's actually difficult for the heat to go from the heat generating uh, transistors all the way to the surface of the die, where a CPU needs a, a, over twice as much of delta T between the components and the surface of the die itself. So naturally, you could also infer from that that all the way up until it reaches the air, uh, you need a bigger delta temperature, for example, between the die itself into the CPU cooler's base itself compared to the die of a GPU and into the cooler base just because of the higher heat density. And since you need to transfer 300 watts every step of the way into each component, you need to use this equation every time. It's, it's bound by this rule every single time as well. So for the heatsink fins into the air, you could easily transfer 300 watts of heat, but it's increasing the surface area, which is what heatsink fins does. Higher surface area means you can transfer a lot of heat, even if the conductivity of air is extremely low. You just need a really huge surface area to conduct it into the air. That's why heatsink fins work, putting all the heat into the air. That's not really the bottleneck in terms of cooling a CPU most of the time. The issue is that we need such huge heat sinks because the problem is the bottleneck of pulling the heat from the cooler base into the heatsink fins themselves. Because you need a high temperature gradient, a delta temperature that's already really high from the die to the cooler base itself, that means you need to keep this really cool. And in order to do that, that means you need to keep the heatsink fins even cooler. So what you want is a heatsink fin that is ideally as close as possible to the ambient air temperature. Or, you know, unless you have an air conditioner blowing right into your PC. But essentially, you want the heatsink fins to be as close as possible to the ambient temperature in order to pull heat from the cooler base as effectively as possible. Because when you have a large temperature, temperature delta between the cooler base and the heatsink fins, then you'll be able to pull more heat from the cooler base uh, just by using this equation here because you can't really change the area that you're contacting the cooler base to the heatsink fins. If you're using a heat pipe, there's just a fix, uh, there's just a specification from the manufacturers of the uh, heat pipes, thermal conductivity, which is what you're gonna put here. And then the area is just like the contacts of the heat pipes and the uh, base of the cooler itself. And yeah, you, all you can do is just lower the delta, uh, increase the delta temperature uh, between the cooler base and the heatsink fins to improve the heat transfer between them. That's why you need such massive coolers. Um, when you have a larger CPU die itself, it also helps with the cooler and that it doesn't need such a low uh, cooler uh, base temperature. Uh, and that helps with not actually needing even such a large heat sink, which you can see with uh, server CPUs where you can have 1U heat sinks that can dissipate close to 200 watts, like this 1U Dynatron cooler, for example. There's barely any heat sink fence on this, and that's really enough if your CPU is a large surface, uh, has a large surface area like server CPUs in many cores. And this is because it compounds the issue when you have a small die that it, not only that you need to absorb the heat from the die itself really fast with a high delta temperature, but because every time you need to transfer heat, you need a delta temperature, you actually need a delta temperature between the center of the CPU cooler all the way to the outside, where usually most of the heat pipes are as well. Like for example, in this Noxio NHU12S that I was using with a D-Lidded 10900K, you can see the imprint of the liquid metal, which is contacting the die. It's really tiny and it's just in the center. So the outside heat pipes are not even directly above the heat source and therefore, to conduct heat from the CPU die all the way to the heat pipes on the side of the CPU cooler's heatsink base itself, there needs it to be a temperature gradient between them. So it just compounds the issue that you need to keep the heatsink fins even cooler to be able to pull heat from the heat pipes for the heat pipes to be able to pull heat from the base itself, which, you know, it also needs to be cooler than the CPU die itself uh, because it's on the outside. So it's just a compounding issue all because of you need a temperature delta to absorb heat, to move heat from one component to the other. And it's just worse when you have a small surface area. And that's really the biggest 
reason that's the, that's the reason why you need a such a huge heat sink and even radiator for water coolers to cool cpus it's not because that the heat sink fins need to be this big to dissipate the heat you can get away with a much smaller a surface area to dissipate heat into the air if you can run the heat sink or radiator at a higher temperature but because cpus with the smaller dies require uh, such a low temperature on the cooler's base itself and you know it's much lower than what you could get away with on a gpu with its larger die that means you need to keep the heatsink fins even lower temperature than the cooler's base itself which means you need to keep it as large as possible in order to uh, bring the temperature down closest as possible to the air temperature and that's really why you need such a huge heatsink and radiator i can actually demonstrate this difference in heatsink temperature uh, in a typical gaming PC, for example, this is an RTX 3060 and a 10850K that's being cooled by a Thermalright Phantom Spirit cooler. They're both consuming similar amounts of power here, with the GPU running a game in the background at about 170 watts of board power, so maybe around like 150, 140 watts on the core itself. And the CPU is, uh, well, slightly higher and 170 watts on the CPU, but probably only like 150 actually on the CPU core itself. And you can see the temperatures on the CPU are peaking at 88 degrees Celsius. This is just running six cores in Cinebench R24 versus the GPU running Tekken in the background. But the GPU is staying much cooler as just 64 degrees and a hotspot of 75 degrees versus like almost 90 degrees for the CPU. And this is the CPU with a really massive cooler and a really strong like over 3000 RPM thermal uh, fan. And you can check out the temperature of the heatsink with just my crappy IR gun here. It's only 37 degrees Celsius. It's really low compared to the temperature on the GPU heatsink itself. Which I can get to focus. As you can see, it's over 40 degrees on the GPU heatsink, yet the GPU stays at a much lower temperature. And again, like I said before, it's because the GPU heatsink doesn't need to keep its base that's contacting the die as cool as the CPU cooler's base itself, just due to the difference in the thermal density. So if you're confused about why you need a higher delta temperature between the cooler and the die for the CPU, which is a smaller surface area to conduct the heat compared to the GPU, you can just think of a water pipe. Let's just say you need to move water, a fixed amount of volume of water through the pipe, and you reduce the diameter of the pipe. What will happen is that you need to increase the speed of the water through the pipe compared to the bigger pipe because you're moving it through a smaller pipe. And in order to increase the speed of the water through the pipe, you need to increase the pressure difference from one side of the pipe to the other. And this is essentially the same with heat. You need to increase the temperature difference from one side to the other in order to increase the speed the heat goes through the material. That means that you can dissipate or move the same amount of heat through the material as using a larger surface area but lower temperature difference. And yeah, that's also how that works in CPU coolers, where CPUs usually these days you need water coolers with the high-end CPUs. Just because the thermal density is so high, you need such a high thermal conductivity from the base of the cooler itself to move it to the heatsink fins or radiator. Because usually the heatsink fins and radiator are not really a bottleneck and you can always increase the fan speeds to move more air through it. The real bottleneck is moving the heat from the base all the way to the heatsink fins or radiator uh, fins. And in the case of a heatsink, you're moving the heat usually through heat pipes, as you can see from this cooler. And heat pipes are actually essentially just the same as water coolers. They use water as a medium to move heat instead of just relying on the conduction of heat through the piece of metal. And th this is much better than just conducting heat on metal because you're not only relying on the thermal conductivity of the material to move the heat, but you're physically moving the heat using the water. As in, once the heat goes inside the water, it gets moved alongside the water itself to the area where it's cooling down the water and it flows back to the base of the cooler. Now for a heat pipe, this flow rate of the water is determined by the design of the heat pipes from the size of it, the wick type and the length and stuff. And it has a fixed uh, watts per millimeter Kelvin rating for a heat pipe itself. 
So you can't really increase the flow rate between the heat pipe and the base. Uh, you, can't, you can't really increase the flow rate of water inside the heat pipes for a heatsink fin, which is why if you increase the fan speed so much on a heatsink, you're starting to get diminishing, diminishing returns. While on a water cooler, what you can do is increase the flow rate of water by just increasing the pump's flow rate, either from a bigger pump or a higher RPM. And in which case, once you have a really high water flow rate, then you can just keep increasing the fan speeds through the radiator to keep dissipating more heat, in theory, infinitely, until you hit the limits of either the flow rate or the fan speeds of, of or the flow rate of the fans. And this is essentially because we're using the heat capacity of water to move heat. And in the case of a water cooler, we can see that the amount of joules that a water cooler can move from the base of the heatsink all the way to the radiator can be calculated by just using the heat capacity of water multiplied by the flow rate. Whereas on the heatsink again, it's a fixed uh, thermal conductivity. So it's a fixed joules per second, just depending on the temperature delta between the heatsink and the base. But since the air is the air temperature, which is a fixed room temperature, uh, you can't really lower the temperature of the heatsink fin so much to keep increasing the delta temperature uh, to increase the joules per second that a heat pipe can transfer. So you're really limited in terms of the amounts of energy that you can transfer from the base to the heatsink for a air cooler compared to a water cooler, which, like I said, you can increase the flow rate. But I think I explained that clear enough for this video on why CPUs need a much higher, more bigger cooler compared to GPUs. But as a recap, essentially a CPU has a smaller die area, which leads to higher heat density. And higher heat density means that you need a bigger delta temperature to dissipate the same amount of heat. And in this case, even though the heat is smaller on the CPU compared to the GPU, the die size decrease on a CPU is just so significant that you still need a much higher delta temperature between the die and the cooler itself in order to dissipate the heat that the CPU generates. And because of the need to have a high delta temperature, that means you need a much better cooler to keep the base of the cooler itself much colder compared to a GPU, which might get away with only a delta temperature of like 10 degrees or so from the die to the base of the cooler. But yeah, that's about it for this video. If you have any questions, please leave them down below. And I will try to get back to doing more videos and even doing GPU buying guides again. But that's it for this video. Thank you for watching and hope you learned something today. Thanks for watching.